like conflict, but um, I even more so don't want to tacitly endorse or communicate that it's okay to bring kids to a drag show. I mean, that's, it's like, like I said in Sunday school, it doesn't take uh, the Bible or being a Christian to just say, you know, maybe not that. Maybe we could draw the line there, you know? And so I'm just, I'm just kind of sharing my, uh, you know, being vulnerable with you or whatever, that I'm kind of averse to conflict or whatever, but the fact is that it just needs to be done. And so if, if you can relate, you know, you don't have to want to do it. Sometimes you're called to do it. And so, Amen. Amen. Uh, and there's power in numbers. Uh, Paul was a bit of a coward. I mean, I know he's the one who told Timothy, God didn't give us a spirit of timidity. You know, he gave us a bit of power, love, and a sound mind. But Paul himself multiple times talks about how he was, you know, in fear and trembling, or he was in tears, you know, or he didn't want to go into Corinth, you know, and God gave him a vision and said, go anyway, you know, so it's, you know, it's been said before that courage is not the absence of fear, it's the presence of strength in the midst of fear, right, so, um, so please come out to that, and, um, and let's, let's do the best that we can in order to make um, people that are just, you know, lost in the darkness of their heart and mind, um, let them not be comfortable in what they're doing. So anyway, I hope you'll be at that 6 o'clock here on Thursday, and also that you'll share the word with others who might be like-minded and be inclined to, to come also. So uh, so now you should be in Second Peter. Let's stand together as we read verses um, 17 to 22. So this is Second Peter, the slideshow says chapter 3, but it's actually chapter 2, we'll start in verse 17, it says, these people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm, blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. This is truly the word of God. You can be seated. You know, if you have kids, or if you plan to have kids, wink, 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 <laughs> wink, 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 wink. Um, listen up, then uh, you'll know that kids know way more than you think they do. Matter of fact, they'll tell you how much they know as soon as you try to tell them what you know. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't cross the street. No, 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 Dad, it's okay. I'm just going to go to the truck. Don't talk to strangers. Yeah, but he has candy, and he's really nice. And I feel, I mean, I, just yesterday, Macy, uh, we went over to my neighbor's house. Solid people, Christians, you know. Uh, but it was the first time we've actually been over there, and that Macy had even met them. And when we came uh, back home, she told me, Dad, if I, they could baby, because they had, they had a bounce house over there. So, of course, they got to be good people. So, <laughs> But when we came back home, she said, Dad, they could babysit me anytime because I felt really comfortable over there. So I said, all right, you got it. <laughs> all day, every day. No. <laughs> being naive is one of the hallmarks of being immature. And the same is true uh, in the Christian faith. Being naive is a hallmark of being immature. And so even the most genuine believer, uh, as a new convert, can be apt to listening to and being persuaded of everything that sort of kind of makes sense, you know? It's those kind of people that I think um, particularly Peter has in mind as he's talking about false teachers. This is the third sermon in a row where we talked about false teachers, and that's because Peter saw that there was a real valuable, uh, that there's a real value in talking and informing his audience about false teachers. And so 
I'm not really going to rehash a lot of what he said already. Um, but we're going to look at, I, I will just say this, that there are, there are lots of different ways that you can distort the gospel. And so if you read in Romans and you see what Paul says about, you know, marking those false teachers that, that, that are in the church, or you read in Titus or in Timothy about Paul saying that you need to be able to point out those who are false teachers, it's not always the same type of heresy. Heresy just means false teaching that, that directly com, uh, conflicts with the gospel. It's not, it's not always the same heresy that he's warning against. So in this particular case, in Second Peter, it seems like the flavor of heresy has to do with, um, with, with these guys claiming to be Christians, but then justifying specifically sexual sin. And so that's the type of heresy mostly that he's talking about. He also mentions, and Aragon preached on this last week, about their uh, defiance of authority as well. So that's another characteristic. But, but, um, but the sensuality, that's the word that's used multiple times in chapter 2, uh, is, is, seems to be like the key theme with these false teachers. So what do we hear about these false teachers this week? Verse 17 starts by showing us the deceiving promise of the false teachers, the deceiving promise of false teachers. First of all, they look promising. This is something you need to know about false teachers, is they look promising. How do we know that? Well, first of all, in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, but there were also false prophets among the people, speaking about the people in the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers. First of all, they're, they're considered and called teachers. That sounds promising. When you walk in a room and you see a bunch of people, you, you, I mean, you, when you walk into a room of strangers, you sort of evaluate everybody based off their first impression. And once in a while, you can kind of pick out the guy that's the smartest man in the room, you know? And if it's somebody who is designated as the teacher, sounds like he's got something to offer here. So that's part of the promise to false teachers is just the simple fact that they are considered teachers. That's pretty simple. That's number one. The question you could have, though, is, well, uh, you know, going back to my analogy, if you walk in a room and somebody's a teacher, well, teacher of what? <laughs> you know, I watched, a, uh, I watched a little documentary recently, and um, it was Stephen Meyer, if you're familiar with him, and Levi was watching it with me, and we were listening to this whole spiel about science and, and Christianity and all that. And I said, Levi, I think, you know, we missed the most important part of the whole video. And he said, what's that? And I rewound it, and I said, it's right there. And I paused it, and it was when it had his title up there, Stephen Meyer, Doctor of such and such and such and such. And then as we watched, I asked, um, you know, so he just said this. Do you think that that's within his field of expertise? Because he's not a doctor in, I mean, if, he's a, if someone's a doctor in biology, it doesn't mean they have a whole lot to say about, I don't know, economics, right? So just because someone's a teacher, that maybe lends them some sort of credibility. But then what are they a teacher of? Well, in this context, they're teachers that are among the believers. That's the second characteristic that we see today. Because it says these people, uh, sorry, in, in back in verse 1, it had said that, that there will be false teachers and that they will be among you. And when Peter says that, he's obviously speaking specifically to believers. So these are teachers who claim to be proficient and knowledgeable in the things of the Lord, in the religion of Christianity. That's their field of expertise. So now this should already start to peel away minor, you know, sort of surface layers of our naivety if we think that Everyone who just claims to be a Christian is a Christian, and everybody who claims to be a Christian teacher, is mu they must be a Christian teacher. Because we've already seen that Peter says there will be people who, one, claim to be teachers, and two, claim that they're specifically good at teaching Christianity and things having to do with Christianity. So we start to see that maybe we need to be a little bit more discerning. Next characteristic, they may even participate in similar activities with believers. They may even hang out with believers. In verse uh, 13, it said that, they, that these false teachers that he's referring to, 
would be uh, amongst them in their love feasts. It says this, they are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. They may even take communion. You know, they may even be an active part of the fellowship. Maybe not just out on the fringe. Maybe not the teacher that just walks through the back door when he has to preach and walks back out and you never get to interact. No, they might be right there with you. This isn't a Pentecostal church, but if it was, you know, a preacher might say something like, touch your neighbor and say, that's sus. If you know what sus is, then you're less than 50 years old, but nobody's laughing, so you didn't get that. <laughs> that means suspicious or suspect. You got to read the audience before you tell a joke. <laughs> anyway, the next characteristic is they may consider themselves qualified. Now, I didn't get this from Peter, um, but I think that it was relevant to bring up. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, one of the problems that Paul had uh, with the Corinthian church was that there were people that were that were trying to trying to garner the attention of the Corinthian church members there and pull peel them away from Paul and his ministry and his message. And what one one of the things Paul says when he's referring to these um, what he called super apostles or false apostles is he says this. He says, "For such people are false apostles." Deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. So in Paul's day, there were even people who said that we're apostles just like Peter and James and John and Bartholomew and the rest of them. We're just like them. And no wonder. So Paul's not real surprised that there would be competitors to his apostolic authority. He says, no wonder, because Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, so it's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. He says, he goes on to say, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then tolerate me just as you would a fool so that I may do a little boasting. Now what he's going to do here is he's going to say, they're, they've given you their qualifications, and somehow you found it persuasive to the point that you're starting to listen to them. Let me show you what I have to offer. And he says, since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. And in fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or, or exploits you or takes advantage of you. He says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about are they Hebrews? So apparently that's what those false apostles were claiming. They're saying, hey, we're like Hebrew of Hebrews. We're the real people of God. Paul says, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am even more. The point that I'm getting at here is that false teachers sometimes will even point to some self-professed uh, qualifications to try to present you know, a resume of sorts to garner their attention and credibility um, from, from those that they're trying to deceive. So here's some characteristics. This is, again, this is how false teachers can look promising. They're teachers amongst the church. They may even participate in the fellowship of the church, and they have, they may be able to impress you with some qualifications that are not necessarily biblical, but they will present as if it's sufficient to justify whatever teachings that they're promulgating. Next, they don't just look promising, but they also sound promising. It says in verse 18, they mouth empty and boastful words. They mouth empty and boastful words. This is alluding to the fact that false teachers sometimes are, or maybe oftentimes are not even really timid or, or ashamed or shy about their teaching, but they'll just be really assertive and really confident. This is what it says. They may even have that thus saith the Lord type of tone in the things that they're saying. Have you ever listened to somebody, uh, I know I know someone who had told me this about their husband, and um, they're on to us, fellas. Wives know that we don't, we're not as smart as we think we are. 
But she was telling me that, hey, did you know, you know, her husband was, his name is Ed. She said, I found out that sometimes Ed just answers a question and doesn't even know what he's talking about. He just gives me an answer. He didn't even know. And I was like, yeah, sometimes you just got to, you know, <laughs> you got to make it look like you know what you're talking about. Have you ever met somebody like that who doesn't, you, they don't know what they're talking about, but they're sure that they can pull the wool over your eyes, and so they'll just go for it. Uh, sometimes that's what a false teacher will be like. They'll be foolish, but they'll be doggone confident in it. <laughs> there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's just, this is how it is. Yep, tell you what. Yep. Mm -hmm. Also... Uh, not only do they sound promising because they're confident, but they sound promising because they appeal to human inclinations. This is, this is uh, similar to what Paul said about, about people who will gather to themselves, teachers that will, you know, tell them what their itching ears want to hear. It takes a level of maturity for somebody to tell you what you want to hear when you know better. It sounds promising because when, when somebody tells you what you were hoping that they were going to tell you. It's kind of like when you go and you ask for advice from this guy but not that guy because you, you, you're pretty sure what they're going to say. So you're going to go over here, and maybe this one will give me what I want. So I'll go. I'll go. And then once they say it, it's like, that's, yeah, that sounds pretty promising. It's because it's what you wanted to hear. Well, that's, what happened, that's what's happening anyway in, in Peter's mind here with false teachers is that they're appealing to natural inclinations. Again, in verse, in verse 18, it says that they, they mouth empty, boastful words. That's the confidence and they, their arrogance. It says, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh. That's the appeal. And so that sounds promising because it's, it's in accordance with some part of my nature, with some part of my inclinations. It, it jives. It's consistent. So that sounds pretty promising. Lastly, he says that they promise freedom. So not only is it appealing or sound promising because it, it resonates with some of my desires, albeit my more base and lower desires, um, but even it has a ring of truth with the higher desire, which is freedom. Freedom's not, freedom's not an ignoble thing to desire. In this case, there, there was some appeal because it, it rang true with the yearning that we have of freedom. Now, all of this, this, the deceiving promise of false teachers is what Peter's referring to in verse 17 when he says that these people are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. You go to a spring expecting that there's going to be water flowing for refreshment and for, for the utility of it. Same thing with a mist. I mean, we don't think about and appreciate water and especially rain the way that they did back then because we're not an agrarian culture. But, um, but you need water. You want water for your crops. You want water for, to be able to bathe for everything. It's, it's, it's an, a necessity and it's an essential quality of life. And Peter says that a false teacher is, is like, is, it's, it's, it, it's like, you know, needing something and seeing that it's right there and then you get there and then you're, and then you're met with disappointment because it doesn't deliver on what it promises. And that's what false teachers are like. And they, again, they look promising for all these, or the, the, the promise is deceiving for all these reasons. They look promising and they sound promising for all, the, all these different reasons I've laid out. So that's the deceiving promise of the false teachers, but next we get the reality of the false teachers. So the reality is, uh, despite what seems promising, they're amongst believers, you know, claiming to be teachers, so on and so forth. Uh, the reality is that they themselves are false. They themselves are false. Now, this is one of those things that's going to sound way more smart than it really is. It's like common sense. Falsehood necessitates a pretend truth. <laughs> I mean... Falsehood necessitates a pretend truth. Listen, if I'm corrupt and then I act corrupt, there's nothing false about that. It's wrong, but I'm, I've expressed exactly who I am. The fact that these teachers are identified as false assumes the fact that they are pretending one thing 
while hiding another, that they present one thing and they withhold another. That's what makes them false. This is, this is, uh, this is pointed out several times when false teachers come up throughout the epistles and even in the gospels. Um, what's interesting, though, what we need to, what, hopefully I haven't lost anybody yet because there's some weird looks out there. I'm not going to say who. I'm just kidding. But what we, what we find, though, is that um, what is presented, that falsehood, that, that masquerade, uh, uh, that, you know, that sort of costume that Paul referred to in 2 Corinthians, that falsehood, I think, can vary. The, the corruption and the inward hiddenness of the, of the sinfulness of the false teacher, that's, that's kind of the same. But what mask is put on could be different. So, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, when Paul's dealing with a different kind of false teacher there, this is what he says about what will happen in the end times. He says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There's a lot of things going on there. That's the reality of these people. But then he says this. Having a form of godliness. So you mean they'll be abusive, but they'll have a form of godliness, and they'll be disobedient to their parents, but they'll have a form of godliness, and they'll be treacherous, rash, and conceited, but still have a form of godliness? Yeah. Yeah, they'll have a form of godliness. How do you have a form of godliness, you know, that, is, that can be recognized by others, yet underneath the surface is this whole list of boastfulness, pride, on and on. Lovers of self rather than lovers of God. So you can have a form of godliness but not even be a lover of God. That's what Paul says. That's, that's one type of mask is that you can just have a form of godliness. Another form of mask uh, that a false teacher could have is, for example, in Colossians chapter 2, 21 to 23. Here it says, he's talking about... Uh, these false teachers who are big on what's called asceticism, which just means like uh, um, self, not self-hatred, but self, uh, like self-harm, like, like discipline to the, to the fact, to, to the point of, um, of really harsh treatment of yourself. He s- says this, what's that? Yeah, that'd, that'd be your word. I wouldn't say that. I, I'm going to sound like you if I say that. <laughs> All right. These rules, it says these rules which have, they're, like, they're going to know I plagiarized if I say self-deprecation. Uh, it says, these rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So this mask of these false teachers include self-denial. You see somebody who is able to, you know, fast or, or, you know, just forego other pleasures that we enjoy, you know, and that can look like, like it's piety, you know, like it's religious piety. He also says it could be, uh, it could, it could, it could um, look similar to worship, He also says that it has the appearance of wisdom, but it's all a mask. Different type of mask, but it's still hiding the same falsehood within the teacher. Those are just a couple examples. There's more that you could see. But the the point here is, is that Jesus said about false teachers, and we'll look at this in a second, that they would be wolves, but in sheep's clothing. They will look like sheep. Now, one of the reasons I'm making such a big deal about this is because the difficulty of this passage has to do with, it it, it says, well, I guess I'll just read it. It says in verse uh, 19, or sorry, verse 20, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, well, how can that be true of someone who's a false teacher? And I'm of the opinion that this is just referring 
to another type of mask of a false teacher. The, uh, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I, in verse 20 here, the, I'll, I'll lay out why, why this is difficult. Some people will read this passage, and then they will remember that in chapter 1, when Peter was talking about the blessedness of us being believers, if you look at it with me, in verse 3 of chapter 1, he's speaking of believers here, and he says, His, God's, divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Now, that's, that's the same thing that he says about false teachers. He says, we have escaped the corruption of the world. And then he says in chapter 2, what we're looking at, that false teachers have escaped the corruption of the world. Should we see that there's a, a contradiction here? Uh, uh, that, that what's happened to believers there in chapter 1, verse 4, is the same thing that's happened to these false teachers, which means that they were actually believers, and then they became not believers? I don't think that that's the case. I think that the whole point is that false teachers look like they are believers. So there's going to be some sort of crossover. There's going to be a mask that looks a lot like a sheep. And whether you want to say it's their appearance of wisdom, whether you want to say it's their form of godliness, or whether you want to say it's the escape from the corruption of the world. Now the question is, well, what is the escape of the corruption of the world? Well, I think the escape of the corruption of the world here is not referring to an inward invisible regeneration that happens by the power of the Spirit. It's not that. Instead, what I think it is, is it's the removal and it, it, it's the removal from the defilements of the world. Some translations even say the defilements uh, in, in this passage in 2 Peter. Meaning that they're, remember that Peter is talking to Jews and Gentiles in this crowd that he's writing to, but especially to Gentiles in my opinion, because back in chapter 1 he says that they, you know, you've received a salvation just like us. Well, who's the us? It's the Jews. I'm going kind of quick here now, I know. But, but what was characteristic of Gentiles is that they were living debauched lives. Don't forget about what he wrote back in 1 Peter. Remember, one of the, one of the ways that, the, that his audience was, was being peer pressured was that you're not partying and, and carousing and reveling in debauchery the way that you used to. And people, people you know, they malign you for that. So these people that he's writing to used to be right out there in the orgies and the parties and the drunkenness, and they don't do that anymore. I think that, that the removal of that and then, the, and then the inclusion and the involvement in the people of God, that's the escape from the corruption of the world. It's that external escape. Be, and, 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 and the last point I'll make on this, on why I think it's talking about the, that, that visible... Uh, uh, external escape, you know, those change of habits and, and whatnot and change of um, associations is because he, when he says that they, that they become entangled back in them, if it's, if it's rather that he's, if the escaping the corruption of the world is, an, is, is speaking about regeneration that's inward in the heart, well, you can't get that doesn't make any sense when he says you're back entangled in them. And he's referring to the habits, the, the sensuality. Like I said, that's the key factor of these false teachers. It's the sensuality and trying to justify their sensuality and trying to cause other people to, to fall into sensuality, all their sexual desires and all that. So it seems to me the escape from the corruption of the world is that they were just sexual perverts before. They re were removed from that, and then they're going back into that, to, to summarize it in a really uh, brief way. So, okay, next. The reality of the false teachers is that they themselves are false. Not just that what they say is false. That, that some, some people think that that's what makes a false teacher, is that what they say is not true. That's part of it, but what they say is not true because they themselves are not true. Three different designations are given to these people in this passage. One is slaves. Two is dogs. Three is pigs. Pigs. 
and they're just doing what, they, what their nature does. It's in, it's, in, uh, it's in verse 19 where they're slaves. It says they promised them freedom. That's their teaching. You know, has, they, they, they purport to, to promise freedom. While they themselves are what? They are slaves. And slaves of what? They are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. That's these guys' true identity. Sure, it looks like they escaped all that, but no, they're inwardly, they're, they, this is what they've given themselves over to and what they're mastered by. Later in, the, in verse 22, I'm, when Peter says, of them the Proverbs are true, a dog returned to its vomit, the return goes to show what the identity of the person is. It's a dog that returns to its vomit. It's a sow or a pig that returns back to wallowing in the mire because that's what pigs do. Because that's what dogs do. That's what slaves do. It's the return back to that that reveals who they truly are. Remember Jesus' word about false teachers. It's very definitive what what, what they can and cannot do. This is Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 18. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are uh, ravenous or ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree Bears bad fruit. Why? Because that's what they do. A good tree will give you good fruit, and a bad tree will give you bad fruit. In case that's confusing and you missed it, I'll tell you again. Verse 18. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. It may take some time, but the, it, it will be inevitable. Pigs act like pigs, dogs act like dogs, slaves act like slaves. Good trees produce a certain kind of fruit, bad trees, and it's just inevitable. It's just what they do. That's the reality. They themselves are false. Secondly, the reality of false teachers is that they are trapped. Verse 19 says, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. That's what their master is. It's depravity. So should we uh, suggest or assume that what this means is anybody who has ongoing sin in their life is necessarily not a believer. They're probably just like a false teacher. No, I don't think so. Well, why'd you just yell at us for the last 15 minutes about this, Michael? Because you just, no, I'm not undoing anything that I said. Here's the difference. These people, and when you read especially the rest of the context, if you, if, if you could put, you know, Aragon's last two sermons, right up against this one, then we'd have a three-hour sermon, and we'd be way more blessed for it, but you guys can't sit through that, so whatever. (laughs) If you were to read the whole whole chapter, though, of chapter two, you will see that sensuality, the sensuality and sexual sin that these guys are involved in, they are proud of it. They're shameless with it. They are committed to it. They're They're not struggling with it. They're not sort of hiding it because they know better and they feel ashamed and they're not vexed by it like what Aragon just said a minute. It's not, that's, it's not the sanctification experience. It's the perversion experience. It's the taking the gospel and saying, you know, Paul even said this, that some people claim that his message uh, was promoting antinomianism, which is that there's no law, that since God forgives sin, then that means you can go ahead and sin. You know what Paul said about that? He said their curse is justified. Their judgment that's coming, people who say that, it's justified. And that's, that's the type of people that P- Peter's referring to, the type of people, people that are sinners just like all the rest of us, but are just proud of it and complacent in it. They're just settled and happy with themselves, being, being as perverted as they want to be, and then also just, you know, going 
claim that God's okay with it. That's not the, that's not the experience of a believer. These people are trapped, and they, and, they, and, they, and they lie not only to others, but even to themselves. So they have no victory or progress over sin, and indeed, they don't even have any fight or striving left in them. That's found in verse 22, when it says that they, they ran back like a dog, back to its vomit, like a pig. Back, they, they ran back into that, and they're just wallowing in that mud like they always, just and enjoying it just like they used to before. You can wash them up for a second. You know, they may tolerate it bad, but they're going right back there. They can't wait for the next one. And they just, they are committed to that. Again, not necessarily every habitual sin is like that. There are habitual sins that, you know, I've, I've heard it said before that sometimes progress looks like this. So you come back, but then you, but then you come back. But then that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what Peter, Peter's talking about this. And they're just satisfied with that. Lastly, there's no shame. No victory or progress over sin. No fight left in them to even try to resist it. And also no shame. And that's what I referred to earlier. But there's the passages you can look at. I'm going to move on just for sake of time. Lastly, the reality of false teachers are not just that they themselves are false, not just that they are trapped, but also that they are doomed. Verses 19 to 21, that's exactly what it's talking about. Verse 20, look at this. It says, They have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which again I think is just referring to the um, stepping out of the debauched life for a little while. If they have escaped the corruption of the world and then are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. That really needs to uh, weigh heavy on, on us. That's a very, very weighty statement. And then to double down on it in verse 21 and say it would have been even better for them to not have even known the way of righteousness. Imagine the apostle Peter who literally died for the purpose of preaching the gospel to say that here's some people that it'd actually be better if they never even heard it in the first place. That's how bad it is to hear, sort of entertain it, and then walk away. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. I know it's been said before that sin is sin, and usually that's in reference to, you know, there's no, well, it's usually in reference to two things. One, there's no difference in any kind of sin. They're all just equally bad. Um, there's some truth to that, but not exactly. But also some people say that sin is sin in reference to the fact that, you know, that they all incur the same judgment. And that's, there is some truth to that in the sense that every, cr- every sin is a crime against God. That's true. But it's not true that there's no gradations at all of punishment. That's not true. There are gradations. There are uh, more and less punishments. I mean, that's exactly what Peter said. It would have been better if there would have been this type of condemned person that never heard the gospel than to be one who heard the gospel, played around with it, and then threw it away. And then he said it would be better for one than the other. It's not the only place where it says that. Luke 12, 47 to 48, there's... Another one, I, I was, won't read that one for sake of time, but also James 3.1, this is even more familiar. I do, I do suggest you read Luke 12, though, because that's one that's forgotten for some reason by a lot of people. It um, talks about, you know, one judgment, he refer, uh, refers to it as few blows, while another guy will get more blows. But anyway, in James 3.1, this is a real familiar passage where it says that not everyone should rush to be teachers because teachers incur a stricter judgment or a harsher judgment. Again, there's a gradation there. And funny enough, that's exactly what he's talking about here, our teachers. So what do we do with all this information about false teachers? Is it just nice to know and, you know, time's up, got to go? Um, oh, sorry, you can get to see that. You could write Luke 12, 47, 48 down if you want to. Um, the whole purpose of this, um, in Peter's heart and mind, is to give a warning. The fact that Peter gives a warning here reminds us what I said in the beginning, 
that as believers, we, you know, there, there is a beginning stage where you're kind of naive. But as you progress, and I hope everybody in here now, at least because of the sound of my voice, will recognize that we cannot afford to be naive. That there is, um, there is a place for enjoying the Christian life. I mean, there's plenty in the scriptures about joy and about the peace that passes understanding that we can have in this life, about the blessedness of walking in his way. That, that's all true. But, but it is also true that there is, there is kind of a militant side, a, a, a sober-minded, severe side. And on this side, one of the things we have to recognize is that there's dangers within our Christian walk. And part of the dangers that we're specifically looking at today are false teachers, are those who even claim to be Christian, who even maybe associate with Christians. But, you know, in this iteration of false teachers that Peter's talking about, they, they, may, they may use their Christianity in order to justify sinful living. I mean, clearly sinful acts. And then in verse, like, for example, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, although I would truly be grieved, if this pride event that happens in a couple weeks has a church there with the, with the pastor, priest, or whatever they want to call themselves, with the rainbow robe on or whatever, you know, because, because that, that happens. Um, so we can't be naive about that, that, yeah, but they have the cross, though. Yeah, I mean, come on now, don't be naive. You know, there are false teachers. So we need to be warned. That's the purpose of this passage. Just the whole reason why Peter wrote this was to warn his audience. And it wasn't even like there was a bunch of false teachers for sure, like specific teachers he, he was referring to, because he says that these people will be among you in the future. He's just saying this as a general warning that we need to all be aware of. And so be aware that, that this is a reality within the Christian life. In verse 18a, it says that they entice. So false teachers are not content just, just to... Ju- only to justify their own sin and, and, and customize their theology in order to accommodate all of their wicked ways. They're not content with just that. They want to recruit. They want to evangelize. They, they want to spread this like gang green. That's what Paul said about other false teachers in another context. But not only do they seek to entice, it says in verse 18a, but in, in 18b and also in verse 14, it says that the type of people that they are going to prey upon and that they'll be, have an effective ministry with are those who are weak. It's those who don't know better. That's why we can't be naive. The ones who, you know, if we are content to, to know the nuts and bolts of the gospel and we love Jesus and then never come back to church again, never read our Bible again, never try to learn anything beyond this, beyond, you know, just stepping through the door, You are vulnerable for attack because there will be somebody coming along who looks good, sounds good, and is convincing enough and kind of resonates with some biases you have toward your own sinfulness, and next thing you know, you'll just be swept right away. Scripture, Jesus himself, is clear on his calls to being vigilant. And so here are the ways in which um, we can be prepared. Um... I want to point out, like I said, that Peter's whole purpose in this was to warn his audience. Well, before this, in chapter 1, he makes this point, that growth and spiritual maturity is critical for safety from false teachers. So you remember back in chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, when he said that add to your faith virtue and to your virtue brotherly love and on and on and on? Well, he, he was calling them to, to not be content with their day one experience of salvation and understanding who Jesus was and who they are, but to now add to that and grow. He said, make your calling and election sure. Then he also says to heed the reminders to the fundamentals of the faith. That's what he says in chapter 1, 12 to 15, when he says that, so I, I will always remind you of these things, you know, of the fundamentals of the faith and then to grow in them. I'm going to keep reminding you, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have, he says, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. As long as I'm on the earth, Peter says, I'm going to keep reminding you, keep reminding you, keep reminding you. Because I know that I will soon be put, aside, uh, put this body aside as our Lord Jesus made clear to me. 
And I'll make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So that's another thing is to heed the reminders of the f- fundamentals of the faith. That's what Peter was concerned with. And then lastly, he says, pay attention to the truthfulness of Scripture. So he says these three things. Grow in your godly character. Not just knowledge, but acting it out. Get more godly in various different ways. Number two, heed the reminders of the fundamentals of the faith. And number three, pay attention to the truthfulness of Scripture. I know there's that really complex passage that we looked at in verses 9 to 21. But within that complex passage is a call uh, 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 for us to heed. He said that we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And he says this, that you will do well to pay attention to. Pay attention to what? The prophetic message. I think he's talking about Old Testament prophecy there. He says you would do well to pay attention to what the Old Testament has to say even. In conjunction with its consistency with the New Testament. Pay attention to these things and be convinced of its truthfulness. And it's from there that he says... But back then when those prophecies were being preached, which we know that are not of any one man's interpretation, they, weren't, they didn't originate in man, we know that about it. it they, those were Holy Spirit given. We know that back then when those God-given prophecies were happening, verse 1 of chapter 2, there were also false prophets. You see the transition there? He says, heed the truthfulness of those words, but remember that there were false prophets back then when those words were being penned. Just like today, there's going to be false teachers also. So his whole purpose here in warning them about false teachers is, is, or sorry, talking to them about false teachers is to warn them. Be warned. It says warning instead of summary or overview, but that was the last slide. So everybody take a breath, all right? (laughs) Let's close the prayer. Father in heaven, I do want to pray that... First of all, thank you that your word is clear and it, and it gives us what we need in order to be vigilant. I ask that you would protect us from all the schemes of the evil one. I'm reminded, Lord, that your word, even just in the passage prior to this one, says that you're able to keep those who are yours, even in the midst of like a wicked land like Sodom and Gomorrah or a world like Noah lived in, you're able to keep us, and so we have confidence in your ability to keep and preserve us, Lord. But even so, we pray, God, that you would uh, deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation. I pray, God, that you would cause us to take our Christian walk seriously, not so serious that we can't enjoy you, but not so frivolous that we forget about the dangers in the world. Help us to recognize false teachers and not be swept away by them, Lord. And, and um, Lord, let us make our calling and election sure before you. In Jesus' name.